Open in your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6, please, with me. And what we're looking at is the Lord's Prayer. And as we look at the Lord's Prayer, uh, prayer could be compared to holding God's hand. That's the metaphor that I'm giving you this morning. Uh, and basically what Jesus does is he introduces God as Father. And uh, he, he tells us that God is our Father. And so the corollary would be that we are his children. And so as his children, God says, I want to know if you trust me enough as your Father to hold my hand. Now, uh, it, it's very interesting in life. As a parent, many of you who have had little children can understand this with me. I, I have seen our children be totally bold and confident until certain situations, then all of a sudden, there's some, either it's so loud or it's so full of people or there's some fearful thing like a, you know, a dog barking and running toward them or something that, that all of a sudden they, they back up toward you and they feel you and you can feel their hand coming up and they want to hold your hand. You see, the Lord says, I'm your perfect, powerful Heavenly Father. You are a child. You are weak. You are small. You, you can't see very far. But I can see everything. I am strong enough for anything. And if you allow, I will walk you through life. Now, again, you know, in parenting, you have these things called hands, and so do they. And it's really neat to go together. When you're holding hands with your kids, they stay with you. It's really, isn't that an amazing thought, that they stay with you? And so Bonnie and I were really good at it. We had one and she held his hand. Then we had two, and so I had one to hold. And we'd hold each other's hands. And then we had three, and then one of us couldn't hold the other's hand, so we, one had two, one had one. Then we had four. Boy, the fifth one, I started thinking about that, so I bought one of those backpack deals. One back there, all the hands covered. When we had number six, we were really in a conundrum, you know? Two backpacks, you know? But, but what's neat is they always stay with you when you're holding their hand. And then when they want to do something you don't want them to do, you feel them pulling away and, and, you know, and, and then they run off toward whatever you said don't do. And they look back at you and they're looking at the distance, they're looking up at you, they're looking at what they want to do, and they're thinking. See, that is so much of what our spiritual life is like. God said, as long as you stay holding my hand, prayer without ceasing means staying connected to God. As long as you stay connected, I'll show you the path of life. You're always doing God's will when you're connected, when you're staying close to him and following where he's going. In my presence is fullness of joy. The Lord said, you're always within an arm's reach. You're never far from me when you're connected to me. And I'll give you fullness of joy at my right hand. The right hand speaks of what I am authorizing. At my right hand, there are endless pleasures. So what, what Jesus says is, first he introduces God, as father. And then he introduces that God as father, as the one that we are to hold his hand in prayer. So uh, this is what we do this morning. First, we have to understand that God is father. And Jesus breaks this out in Matthew chapter 5. And the first time he says this, and you can look in your Bible, look at Matthew 5, 16. And Jesus starts talking about God as Father. He introduces, this is the first time this concept comes through. And we have to understand that, that we are born again into his family and God becomes our Father. The new birth is the doorway, the entrance to this relationship. And it's only through the salvation that God the Father planned and provided through so loving the world that he gave his son as a sacrifice. So first we understand that God is our father, and then we learn what it means. So what Jesus does is he says, now I want you to understand what it means that God is your father. If you look at verse 16, he talks about your father in heaven, and then in verse, this is chapter 5, verse 16, he's first the father in heaven. Then when you look at verse 34, he's he connects heaven as being God's throne. And so he starts introducing God first as this all-powerful one sitting on the throne. So he says, I want you to, to learn what it means that God is your father. And then Jesus, right in the middle of that, chapter 6, verse 9 says, and that's who I want you to pray to. I want you to pray 
to your father that I've just introduced you to. And we went through all those last week. We looked at all the, actually the 15 times father is occurring in the very middle one uh, is the one where he says, pray to your father who is in heaven. So Jesus introduces God, but then notice what he does. He gives us these attributes to help us understand God. Now, I'm, I'm going to take a little time this morning to talk about attributes because the more we comprehend the way that, that God is revealed. Now, now, you can just think. You know most of these. Uh, first, he's called Father. That is a, a name or a title. He is a father. But also, he is, he is called by titles that, that we know like the the creator of heaven and earth. That's a title. And all of those things reflect his character. It's revealed through his name. In fact, the very first name Moses got is, uh, God said, I am that I am. You know, the I am one? I am that I am. And actually, you see Jehovah or Yahweh, that's how you say that name in Hebrew. That is actually a conjugation of the verb to be. Ayeh is in Hebrew. Ayat means I am. And God said, that's my name. I am. Not was, will be. I am. And see, that's a revelation. How we understand God is through the revelation of his names, his titles, and his attributes. And so what Jesus did is he, he gives all these to us. And this is a summary. If you take all those attributes that I showed you last time and, and just look at some of them, starting in, in um, Matthew, uh, look at uh, Matthew 5 and verse 45, where Jesus says this, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He makes his son rise. His. God owns the son. You know, there's a lot of people that are buying trophy properties these days. You know, um, I don't know if you read the news, but I mean, there are things selling for incomprehensible amounts of money. Uh, apartments and high-rises in New York City for $100 million. I mean, a hotel just sold yesterday in somewhere in Southern California for $600 million. It's an unprecedented amount of money per room. I mean, they're going to have to rent those rooms for $600 a night permanently to pay the bill. And, and so people are buying these trophy properties. God says, you want to know what a trophy property is? I own the son. Can anybody else claim that? And I make my son, S-U-N, rise on the just and the unjust. What, what Jesus is saying is, the father I'm introducing you to rules. He owns. He created. He controls the universe. And he is all-powerful, or as we know it, omnipotent. But it means all-powerful. So Jesus says, I want to introduce you to my Father. And I want you to... He, my Father has his hand extended to you. And if you choose, you can reach up and connect with him and say, Father, the one who's in heaven, the one who rules the whole universe, this is, what, this is what I need to share with you. But when you connect with him, it changes everything about how we share. Why? Because he understands everything. He feels our needs. He is not like a high priest who can't understand our needs, as, as the book of Hebrews says, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands humanness. He, he feels, what, what is the most frequent emotion of Christ in the Gospels, the 89 chapters? Compassion. What does compassion mean? Sum patheo, sympathy, means you feel with someone. Actually, compassion, the word Jesus uses, is the word, it's a visceral word. It means you can feel. He, he felt inside our pains. He feels our needs, and he gives to us. Those are understanding, feeling, and giving is all an expression of his love. God is always loving, which means as we come and approach him, our, your father already understands what you're coming about, but he wants you to share. He already feels what you're going through, but he still wants you to tell him. And he wants to give, look what it says here, 
good. Look at chapter 7, verse 11. I mean, all these are, are predicated on what Jesus revealed. And he says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? He's the Father, we're the children, he gives good things. But we're supposed to ask. See, that's what prayer is about. How much of your day do you want to go through without asking and staying connected to God? It, it, it's very interesting. The more you understand the connection between prayer, understanding life, and knowing God's will, it's all interconnected unbelievably by Jesus. And then he said, this same Father sees everything. Look at Matthew 6, 4. Uh, and you remember we went over these last week. In Matthew 6, 4, the Lord says this, your charity will indeed be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, he, he sees what, what is being done, and that's a, a reflection of, of his all-knowingness, his omniscience. Uh, there are two attributes here, omniscience, omnishio, all-knowing, and also, this is actually his wisdom. You talk about someone that, that makes great decisions. Someone who sees everything, knows everything, forgets nothing, knows everything equally vividly, are, is a great person to ask advice from. I mean, they already know what's going to happen, and they even know how we fit in the intricacy of what God's parameters, because God allows us to make choices within his will. And we can... I mean, it's very interesting, uh, you know, if this is God's will for us and, and this is what he wants, he has in there the, the avenue that we can choose to stay in that he rewards, and over here we can bump along in here in all this disobedience. He still has the guardrails. He doesn't let us go beyond his will, but he has for us the time we walk holding his hand and the time we pull our hand away and do our own thing. And this part of our life, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, will be burned up. Because God says, you chose to live that not connected to me, not holding on to me, going your own way, pulling your hand out of mine, saying you can make it on your own. I'll burn all that up, but I'll reward you for everything that we do acknowledging his wisdom and omniscience and saying, I need you. And finally, he's everywhere present. Look at 6, 8. I love this one. It says, uh, therefore, don't be like them, for, for your father knows what you have need of before you ask him. I mean, you talk about the God who is walking through life, seeing where we are. He knows everything about us and what we need before we ask him because he's right here watching. He knows we're weary. He knows we're troubled. He knows we're... And look at verse 18, uh, a little bit later, further down. It says, And don't appear to men to be fasting, but your Father, who is in the secret place, 618 says. Your Father is already there. I mean, he's watching. And he's not just watching through binoculars. He's watching right there. You know, it reminds me of... Uh, shouldn't tell you this, but a dear friend of mine lives in uh, Oregon. Uh, Bonnie and I spent a lot of time with him, and, and uh, he was very successful in his career. And he bought his wife uh, a BMW, like 629B or I or Q or something, you know, one of the really sleek ones. And he bought her the very finest uh, radar detectors. I mean, the kind that cost hundreds, not just a simple one. And it's you know, cloaked, you can't even see it, so they can't tell you have one. And she, was, she would go visit her mother in the nursery home, and it was 100 miles, and she could make it in an hour. I mean, she actually drove 100 miles an hour the entire way down the highway. And uh, uh, Sally was a good friend of mine, I wouldn't want to ride with her, but you know. And one day, <laughs> one day, she got pulled over, and the, the rolled her window down and looked up at the policeman and said, could I just ask you a question? She said, my husband bought me the very finest radar detector. How on earth did you catch me? He said, well, you passed me, ma'am. <laughs> you see, that's, that's, that's what we have to realize, that 
God is there. You can't do anything. He's watching, and, and he sees us when we pass him because he's always present. But let's, let's keep going on this. So God has attributes. But how do we, how do we is it like the God, the Father, only has these attributes? And, and when does he have them? And, and do they conflict with each other? Do they collide sometimes? How does all that work? And by the way, that's what we've been doing as, as elders. We, we are in our 53rd month of reading a 56-chapter doctrine book. And, and we read one chapter a month. And, and one of the lessons we learned, we learned is this, that God's attributes aren't additions. It isn't like we have this amazing God, oh, and he's got mercy, you know, out there somewhere. Kind of like, you know, Costco has Costco, and then they have all the pad sites, and you're going to see them in the future. They're going to start building little things on the periphery. God's love is not a peripheral, his justice, you know, his omnipotence, his holiness. It, they aren't outlying parts. It's not in addition to who he is, God's attributes. Neither is God a collection. See, and some people, you know, they're trying to figure this out. They say, yeah, there's God. He's just, but he's loving. So I guess you know, dying on the cross is loving, and maybe the hell part is justice and wrath, you know. And it's almost like these aren't really connected. And, and maybe they operate like cylinders in the car, you know. And so he's operating in the cylinder. No, no. God isn't a collection of attributes that, in fact, uh, the, the terrible missionary, Albert Schweitzer, he believed that the, the Old Testament God was a God of wrath, but the New Testament God is a God of love. And we should serve this New Testament God of love who doesn't send people to eternal destruction because he didn't believe in the wrath of God. He didn't believe in the necessity of the shed blood of Christ because that's barbaric and that's Old Testament, kind of the, the one that wanted animals and killed Canaanites. You know, he's the Old Testament. We want this loving. And, and they don't realize that God's holiness is not separate from his love, and nor is his wrath separate from his mercy. And that God is, knows everything and has wisdom. He's planned the very best way, but he's jealous because he loves us. And, and so it's not a collection of attributes, what it is, and this is what Grudem, um, it, it didn't come out, it's kind of fuzzy, but what he said, it's kind of like this. He says, this is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, Father, Son, and Spirit. And then we say God is love. But also we say God is holy. But also we say God is just, wrathful, and jealous, and merciful. And what he's saying is God is completely, God the Father is all of the attributes all the time in perfect unity. They don't function independently. It's not like the, your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. And it's not like, oh, oh, that was a wrathful thing. Better think about love next time. You know, no. They're perfectly, eternally united. So he is one God, three persons, and the one God in three persons See, we don't have three gods. We have one God who eternally exists in three persons. And that means, Jesus put it this way. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen what? The Father. That means that they're co-equal, co-eternal, they are exact. Jesus said this in Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of God the Father's glory, and the express image of God's person. Jesus is the exact visible representation of God. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. See, that's, that's how God has revealed himself to us. And by the way, that's how the Spirit is. Although within the Trinity, they all have roles. And uh, uh, the Spirit is the one that takes 
from the Father the work of Christ and applies it to us. That's Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? And you see the, the interplay between the members of the Trinity and they have their roles and, and everything. But what does that mean? Well, let's take this overlay now. Go back to what Jesus revealed about his Father in heaven. And basically what you see is that many of them talk about his omnipotence. Jesus also talks about this caring, loving, giving God. He also talked about the one that's everywhere. You can't get away from him. And the one who sees everything and knows everything. So basically, God, the Father in heaven, is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and loving. So what does that mean? What that means is, omnipotence means our Father is a sovereign creator and a life giver and sustainer. And what Jesus does is he ties together what the Old Testament revealed about God. Now, just for a second, turn back to the book of Psalms. And you can start tagging all of these promises and realizing this is who we're talking to. That's what Jesus was trying to do. He's trying to say, the mighty God, Psalm 147, 4, let me get there. Look what it says about him. He counts the number of the stars and calls them by names. Now, that's really interesting. There's two ways of counting. I could go like this. I could say, oh, let's see, there's about eight in a square, and so there's about 300 of you. No, it's not that kind of counting, kind of a guesstimate counting. It's actually like, if you take out, if you have currency, you know, American currency, if it hasn't been counterfeited, it has a serial number on it, and it's the only one that has that serial number. You understand that? They're all numbered, if they're real. And there's, you know, there's, there's this this registry of all the unbelievable trillions of them there are. And that's what God says. I am the sovereign creator. I'm the one that, that not only has numbered all the stars. Notice that it says in verse 4, he's counted the number of them. He's actually serial numbered every star. But they're not just a number. He calls them all by what? What does it say? By name. And, and now in context, look what verse 3 says. The one who wants to heal the brokenhearted, verse 3 of Psalm 147, and bind up your wounds is the same one that is so powerful. He made all the stars and he's, he's serial numbered them all, but he's called them by name. But it doesn't end there. L look at what Isaiah continues this idea. Isaiah 40, so go to the right. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah. There it is. And Isaiah 40 is one of the great chapters on the character and attributes of God. Amazing. And Isaiah 40 and verse 26, look what it says. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. See, he's the sovereign creator. He, he of himself chose and has the ability without exhausting even in a measurable amount of his power, he created everything from nothing instantaneously and and then he rolls it out for us in the the beautiful record of uh, of Genesis creation but but it continues he he created these things who brings out their host by number there's that numbering serial number and calls them all by name and as if that's not enough by the greatness of his power and by the strength of his or the greatness of his might and the strength of his power None of them are missing. The Lord says, I'm not missing any stars. It's not like one of them went off the radar, you know, kind of like Malaysia flight MH370, we can't find it, you know. God says, none of the stars are missing. I, I'm tracking them all. In fact, this verse, Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says, he's holding them together. And, and what's, you know, like charges repel, right? Remember that from high school science. Did you know at the nucleus of, of every atom there are like charged particles and they're not repelling? What's, what is holding them together? God says, I'm holding it together. And Second Peter 3 says, when I'm not holding it together, it's all going to dissolve. He says, I hold your life breath. Uh, nothing, Luke 137, is too hard for me. No one can take you out of my hand. Nothing can separate you from my love. I am able to keep you from falling because I'm omnipotent. That's who you're talking to, Jesus said. And 
our Father loves and gives and feels and responds. I mean, look at, look at the level of God's love. Psalm 84, 11. I mean, back up now. You now know the pathway between Psalms and Isaiah. Look at Psalm 84, 11, and think about this is who we're talking to. This is who wants to hold our hand. This is the one. I mean, he is so powerful, but yet Psalm 84, 11 says this, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Now, remember Matthew said, it's my son. You know, I'm the one that owns the sun, the star that's near you, but I'm also like a son. He said he's a son. That speaks of his provision. He's a shield that speaks of his protection. The Lord will give grace and glory. That's his, this loving God. But look at specifically, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts you enough to reach out to you in prayer and say, God, I need to hold your hand because I don't want to get lost. I need to hold your hand because I, you know, it kind of looks uncertain around here. I, I, need, I need you. And, and I, I want to stay on the right path, so I'm just going to hold your hand. So as I look around, that's what my kids used to do. They would be, you know, going like this and looking at everything, and I'd just be tugging them along, you know. But they knew they were staying with me because they were holding on. And Jesus said, you need to hold on to the ones who's all-powerful, who always loves you, who's always present, who knows everything. Now, this one is fascinating, this, this omniscience one. Uh, in fact, turn to Psalm 139. This, this, you're in Psalms. Just look at Psalm 139. The 139th Psalm is, is an amazing unveiling of the character of God. You've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down. Uh, by the way, New York Times said that we're killing ourselves. We sit too much, so God knows that. He knows we're killing ourselves because we're sitting too much. You know my rising up. You can get a nap for that. It goes beep. You need to stand up, you know. It keeps track of your movement. Uh, you understand my thoughts afar off. I mean, God says, I know what you're going to think about before you think it. And if you hold my hand, I can guard your thoughts. I can bring them into captivity. Some people's thoughts are going, oh, they're just going out of hand. And God says, I can bring them into captivity. I know your thoughts. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue. You know it all together. I mean, on and on we can go. Our Father, and, and if, you, if you keep reading, he says, I formed you in your mother's womb. Did you know that all of us are genetically modified? You know, the people, GMOs, people don't want any genetically modified uh, produce because who knows what it might do to you. God says, I genetically modified you. I created you. I'm the one that picked what you look like, what family I put you in. By the way, I, I'm, I'm omniscient. I actually, and I'm the present, I was at your birth, God says. I was in the delivery room. In fact, I helped your parents meet each other. In fact, I protected your grandparents so they wouldn't be killed in a train wreck so that you would be born. I know everything about you. You know, now medically, you're supposed to do your family tree and look at your history and incidences so you know what diseases you might get. God says, I happen to know that too because I genetically modified you specifically because I love you. I didn't even go through this verse. You know what that verse says? I've loved you with an everlasting love. I love you completely. No one can love you to the level that I love you. No one can love you to the extent. No one. He says, I, I love you with an everlasting love that will never go away. And I'm working everything in your life because I love you, because I'm with you, and I know everything about you for my good because I love you so much. And I created you, Ephesians 2.10 says, for good works. And only if you st stick with me can those happen. So that's who... Jesus introduces, he wants us to talk to. And so what we can do is we can start framing our prayers. That's a target right there. Let's just put anything in, like um, waiting uh, for a job. So you say, God, what should I do? And he says, well, I'm the one who owns the sun, Keep the stars up there. Just trust me, okay? And while you're trusting me, I am 
I am giving you what you need. I'm feeling what you're going through. I'm responding as you cry out to me. I will never harm you. So I want you to trust me. But I, I'm always with you and standing with you. And you know what I found out? You're letting go of my hand. And you're going your own way. And it's not very comfortable when you go your own way. You get off the path. And I designed you and I know how much you like to operate on your own and so I'm taking away your job so you'll trust me. And you know, most people when they've got money saved and you know, locked in contract, they kind of feel more comfortable letting go. Saying, thanks, got it now. I'm going to make it. And so what does the Lord do? In his love and power, he knows that the only way you can get us back on track. It's kind of like rumble strips. You ever been driving along and your wife finally, husbands, she'll finally say, okay, I'll go to sleep. You stay awake. You know, it's, we're driving all night. You, you're sure you're awake? Okay. And then all of a sudden, brrr, you go down one of those rumble things. She sits right up and says, are you sleeping? What happened? You say, no, 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 no. We're, it's, the road is narrowing. You know, it's construction site. Don't worry about it. But the rumble strips of waiting for a job, or, I mean, you can put anything in this you want. Uh, you know, uh, cancer, a cancer scare. What is that for? It's to hold the hand of the Lord tighter and saying, I have cancer? If you didn't want me to have cancer, you'd take it away. It, you'll never harm me, and, and this must be for your good. And you're standing with me. I mean, you actually watched it, the cells multiply and start being mutinous before the doctors even knew about it. And you designed me, and you choose the best for me. So I'm saying, God, you who choose the best, if you don't want to take away the cancer, if you love me so much that you want me to be with you, because I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you unto myself, Going home is supposed to be the thing we look forward to most. Yet when the Lord, that always makes me think of Priscilla Crego. Remember St. Priscilla? Uh, Roy plays the harmonica. Uh, I came into the office and Anna says, um, you need to call Priscilla. She just got the news. Just a few weeks left to live. And I thought, you're making me call her? Thanks. You know? No, that's, you know, not really. So I said, ah, I'd, I'd love to call Priscilla. And I opened my Bible and I was trying to think, what am I going to say to someone that has two weeks left to live? And so I called. I said, hello, calling for Priscilla. Oh, pastor. I said, yes. She said, you heard. How can I refuse an invitation from my king to go home? I shut my Bible. I thought, I don't need to share that verse with you. <laughs> You know that God could have taken away, know that he'll never harm you, know that he was with you, that he formed you and designed your body. He chooses the best for us in his amazing wisdom. And what we say is, if I can glorify you more and have people come to know you better, if you remove this from me, as Jesus said, Father, take this cup from me. But if not, if you won't take this cup from me, not my will, but yours be done. See, that's the prayer of someone holding on to an omnipotent, loving, omnipresent, and all-knowing God. So what are we supposed to do? Jesus said, what I want you to do is, I want you to start getting to know the person that is known every day of your life. He's been in every car with you, every classroom with you, every work every bus ride, every walk. I want you to get to know him. He's got his hand out, and I want you to walk through life, staying close enough to be connected to him. You'll always stay on the right path. Sometimes you'll be holding on and just gazing at wonder. Sometimes you'll be holding on to him and pointing at all the problems and say, oh, what's going to happen with all this? And he'll say, it's okay. And sometimes you're going to be asking him to help other people. But I want you to trust God enough. To pray without ceasing is what Jesus said. Well, that's what Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Let's bow for a word of prayer. And as we bow, I invite the uh, elders and deacons to begin preparing to serve us communion. Father in heaven, 
Thank you that we can call you our Father. Thank you that Jesus described what, you, what that means, who you are, how great you are, our all-powerful, always present, all-knowing, always loving God. I pray that we would begin to look at our daily lives through your character, that, that you can see a lot further and a lot more clearly than we ever will. And the more we trust you, the more we hold more tightly to your hand and say, show me your way, show me the path, what's your will. I want your glory, not my comfort. I want your will, not my convenience. I want your provision. I don't want my self-made security. It's so fragile. I want the security of feeling your everlasting arms beneath me, that you've beset me before and behind, and place your hand over me. I pray that we would, at this communion, exalt with our worship as we declare Christ. Perhaps the highest offering we can offer is when all of us gather with one heart and one voice to say, you gave yourself for me. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to be our Savior. Thank you for this bread, the picture of his perfect, sinless body that became our sacrifice in our place. And I pray that you would energize us as we worship you through communion. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.